I was 13, 14 years old and I had my own little uh, sheep ranch. Circus performer. Uh huh. And uh, eventually started running the High Wire Act. High Wire Act is very much like running an AI company. I was a poor kid, you know, growing up in the in the country, but I was ambitious and got rejected by everybody but Brown. Clerked for a federal judge for a year and started John H. Snyder PLLC. Big firms as they don't train their associates to go out and get business. What gave me the impetus to do it? Probably being too stupid to know better. Five, six, seven cases at a time going. The force of nature when it comes to litigation, you know, they, sometimes they call me the hurricane and him the rainbow. But the world's gonna tell you who you're supposed to be talking to. Nobody wants to represent the engineer against the VC or the company, right? Yeah. Because you do that, you're gonna lose all your all your VC clients. I'd call myself the engineer's law firm and pretty soon I had a roster full of engineers for how we could use a particular type of AI to vastly improve the way we search unstructured data, which is what lawyers have to do all the time. Data scientist named Mac McCartney, who's been a 30 year data scientist, 20 years machine learning, becoming buried in data, and I saw the quality of the courts plummeting, to be perfectly honest, is optimized for the kind of disputes that we had 80 years ago. Solving that much paper is a very different project than 20 terabytes of unstructured electronic data. 99.9% .9 of people can't afford to go to court and litigate a significant case. How do I structure my work so that I see the relevant stuff, but don't waste time on irrelevant stuff? Those documents, biological concept. And when I learned that that was feasible, First beta tester was my law firm because I do ha still have a couple cases that I'm doing. Clusters the results into uh, conceptual buckets, let's say, with labels on them. And that enables you to navigate through a giant pile of unstructured data, obviously in law, but also media, also private investigations, political campaigns and op research. Spoken word is now more powerful than, than the written word. Analysis and search of audio video data. A legal platform yeah. has a front to back comprehensive workflow that will enable a lawyer to review a massive amount of data. All of this is very, very new. And the economics of AI, I think are not very well understood. Mm. Like when you're actually at trial yeah. and a witness is testifying, we're creating a tool that will take the words that are spoken transform them into a search that gets run once every five seconds or so. The actualized plan that anybody's ever come forward with to reduce significantly the cost of justice. You don't have enough money to make a lot of mistakes. So high wire is what you do when you're fearless and young. And uh, AI is what you do when you're fearless and a little bit older. Uh, luck seems to happen when you work your ass off. Willingness to beat my head against the brick wall until I break through. Welcome to Startup Hunter, also streaming on YouTube. I'm here with Mr. John Snyder, Esquire. Yes, sir. And he has started an artificial intelligence company called Agnes Intel. Yes, sir. And we're gonna get into the story of that, but come take a walk with me if you would. We're looking for startups that have made it, that are making it, or that have failed and have an interesting story. And Mr. Snyder here is a established attorney, but he is now a full-fledged tech entrepreneur. And before we even get to your current project, I wanna take a step back, all the way back if you would, and tell me a little bit about your childhood. And where I would like to start is, what did your parents do? Well, my mother was a uh, stay-at-home mom when I was growing up. Uh, and then when the kids left, she went to the University of San Francisco and actually got her degree in uh, data science. Uh, yeah. so, so she became a data scientist uh, uh, you know, in her 40s. And how about your father? My father was a uh, uh, disabled Vietnam vet. He uh, had been in Vietnam uh, and he uh, painted houses. Were your parents entrepreneurs? My dad owned his own uh, house painting company and I grew up uh, going with him to jobs and helping him paint houses. Right, so there, that, there's something interesting there um, just in owning your own business. And how do you think that shaped your life? And, 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 and let me ask a follow-up question. 
Um, what was the first entrepreneurial thing that you did? Did you sell lemonade? Did you, do you have a story about, about something like that? Sure, well, I, uh, I grew up in a tiny town in Eastern Washington called Wenatchee. Um, well, actually, I was born in Ephrata, then gr grew up in Wenatchee. At any rate, uh, we were out, uh, way out in the country, and my first entrepreneurial venture was uh, I mowed lawns and uh, worked on a sheep farm, and I actually got my own sheep, uh, which we kept out uh, by our house. And so I had, I was 13, 14 years old, and I had my own little uh, sheep ranch. So were you uh, doing wool? Were you shearing them for wool? Mostly meat. Mostly oh, meat. sheep meat. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we had, well, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, inside baseball on that. Uh, the particular sheep that we had were a blend between Suffolk, which are black faced sheep, and uh, Columbia Rambouillet, which are sort of a more white faced sheep. And we bred them together so they'd have good meat as well as good wool. Mm. How's that for detail? That is, that is, I, I, it's, it's cool. Um, <laughs> I never knew the, the names of sheep's, uh, sheep, sheep breeds. You're doing this as a kid and then you decide, you, you, you go to college. And why did you decide to study law? Did you know that you wanted to be a lawyer? Well, you know, be, before, uh, before going to college, uh, I had three little sisters and they took gymnastics classes. So I started learning gymnastics and that led to me, there's a little circus called the Wenatchee Youth Circus yeah. near where I grew up and I joined the circus. And in the summers from age 10 to age 18, I was a circus performer uh -huh. and eventually started running the high wire act. I was a high wire walker. And so I would say actually the, uh, uh, you know, putting on a high wire act is very much like running an AI company. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Well, you have very talented people uh, with no margin for error. You get to high wire, and then how'd you how'd you get from high wire to, to law, or did that did that decision happen in, in undergraduate? I was uh, always a pretty. I was a poor kid, you know, growing up in the in the country, but I was ambitious and. I decided when I was about 16 years old that I was going to go apply and get into an Ivy League school because that was a goal of mine. Yeah. And I think I applied to all of them and got rejected by everybody but Brown. Yeah. Uh, Brown let me in. And, uh, you know, I went initially to be uh, pre-med, but I got, I got uh, weeded out of that. I uh, ended up being a history major. And, you know, there's pretty much no occupational use of a history degree other than law school, so I went to law school. Do you feel it was like by default or was there something, you know, were you saying to yourself, I guess I'm gonna be a lawyer? No, you know what it was? If you're not schooled in law, the law is a tool of, you know, it's a weapon of oppression. And so I said, nobody's ever gonna be able to dominate me on a legal standpoint. So I learned how to be a lawyer and I made myself into one of the top 100 litigators in the state of New York. Let's, let's rewind just a little bit. So you're in law school. Did you find it difficult or fascinating and invigorating and inspiring? Harvard Law School in those days uh, was not nearly the, uh, sorry about that, not nearly the uh, user-friendly place it has become today actually. Elena Kagan did a lot of good work making it a, a nicer place to go. I myself did not find Harvard Law School to be a joyous place. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like Harvard Law School at the time I was there was uh, not an entrepreneurial place. It was more a place that you go to work in big organizations. So you're really at the height of the big law firm, the height of the, the established uh, law firm, and the, the general idea was if you didn't have enough means to go out on your own, you, you'd have no choice but to, to join a big firm. And isn't that what you did? Oh, it, it actually is. And that was, you know, keep in mind, this is 2002. We just had the tech bust. Right. Uh, and so there was really nothing going on in tech. Uh, and so the thing you did if you were a Harvard Law student is you try to get into uh, the best firm you could. And so, I ended up, uh, well, actually, I clerked 
for a federal judge for a year right after law school, and then I joined Proskauer Rose. And they're here in the city? Yeah, they're a, they're a big New York firm. They got offices other places as well. How long did you spend there? I was there for seven years, 03 to 2010. And uh, end of 2010, I left and started John H. Snyder PLLC. I had a very similar experience. Um, save, I saved a lot of money. I was very frugal, you know? Um, and, and you just get to a certain point where, at least I did, I had enough money in my bank account that quitting was not a financial risk for me. Right. And were you, um, was, what gave you the impetus to say, I'm gonna go make it on my own. I'm gonna go out. Uh, did you have clients who you felt that you could call upon, who knew you? Did, did that give of you some confidence? Of course not. No, no, as a matter of fact, one of my criticisms of big firms is they don't train their associates to go out and get business. Yeah. You know, and so when I started out, I'd never gotten a client in my life. So you said, what gave me the impetus to do it? Probably being too stupid to know better. <laughs> Tell me about the early years of of your own of your own law firm. Uh, how'd you get how'd you get your first client? My first client is kind of a funny story because uh, it was a uh, uh, couple of brothers called Kevin and Donald O'Sullivan, and uh, they're developers, real estate developers here in the city. Very, very good you? guys, and. Uh, well, they were getting sued and they needed somebody to basically spend three hours writing an answer. And they said, you know, just put in an answer. The case is going to settle. Don't worry about it. So I took, you know, I was, I was like, well, 400 bucks an hour, three hours, 1200 bucks. Beautiful. So, yeah. so I took the job, you know, the three hour cases are never really three hour cases. This one ended up taking about four years and uh, I ended up trying a uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy case in bankruptcy court for him. So uh, uh, that just kind of goes to show how how uh, three hour jobs can mushroom. Well, I think when you get a good client, um, and, you know, in starting a business, they like your work and they can pay you um, well. That to me is a really good thing. It's a really lucky thing. And uh, you know, I think I think you can't have a strong business without strong clients. Got to have strong clients. That's right. Um, so, this, so, so, so you get a, you get a break. Uh, you you build a business. Um, I assume you get other clients. It wasn't just one. No, client. no, it was a bunch of clients. I would usually have probably five, six, seven cases at a time going. Um, you know, and they always seem to kind of heat up at different times, so. Now, did you have other, um, did you grow your company or was it just a, a real solo kind of practice? Oh, no, I had I had, uh, I had a partner, Tom Sima. Yeah. Uh, and now, he, did you go out with him no, right no. from the get-go? No, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a funny story. I met Tom Sima. Tom Sima had his own firm. Tom needed to sue and he didn't, you know, he wasn't a litigator and so he asked around, do you know a, a good litigator who could handle a crazy case like this? And everybody said, call Snyder. So that's how he and I met. So you guys met um, through, through referral. And how did you make the decision to actually partner up in a business sense? Well, I would say that, you know, he had skills that complemented mine. He's a very smart uh, corporate lawyer, understands deals, understands transactional deals, understands the tax implications. Uh, so he's kind of a chess master when it comes to structuring deals. Yeah. And, and you know, that's not a skill that I learned at all being a trial lawyer. So the way I see it is you're, you're, you're great in the courtroom and he's maybe not so great in the courtroom. You know, it's, he would, if he chose to learn, he'd be very good in the courtroom. Yeah. Uh, but that's just not where he developed his skills. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm sort of like, uh, I'm sort of like a force of nature when it comes to litigation. You know, sometimes they call me the hurricane and him the rainbow. Uh, <laughs> Which is a great com like, you know, yeah. opposite, uh, there's a lot of complementary forces right there. Well, you know, when everything's 
you know, you're in a deal or you're, you got some, something going, everything's going sideways. You know, sometimes you need somebody to come in and blow it up and then, and then fix it. Good so cop, bad cop. that, that, uh, it works. Okay. So you, you, you ran your own law firm for about seven years. That's right. And now you're running a tech company. So how did this happen? Like, let's, let's get into Agnes Intel, uh, an artificial intelligence company. And uh, how did this happen? Yeah, how, how do you go from being a history major lawyer to a data science entrepreneur? Uh, well, what happened was, you know, you're out on your own as a lawyer and, uh, you know, you get whatever you end up getting. And, uh, you know, I like to tell, oh, careful. I like to tell lawyers, uh, you know, you may start out with an idea of who your client should be, but the world's gonna tell you who you're supposed to be talking to. Yeah. And in my case, I was supposed to be talking to genius tech engineers. Uh, because what I found in technology is that everybody, all the lawyers, they want to represent the VCs, right? Because you those know, are... How about we walk on the sunny side of We can do that, room. yeah. <laughs> it is freezing. Yeah, it is pretty chilly. You know, let's try not to get killed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. So like I was saying, lawyers uh, in tech, you know, all the big firms and even the small firms want to represent the VCs because they provide, you know, the paying work and repeat deals. Yep. Um, or at minimum, they want to represent the company, right? Nobody wants to represent the engineer against the VC or the company, right? Yeah. Because you do that, you're going to lose all your, all your VC clients. Indeed. So, so you know, so you know, no lawyer was stupid enough to start representing engineers. Except. Except for me. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and so I said, are, are we allowed to swear? Is this uh, no swear? I just go for it. Okay. Well, I mean, now it's now the moment's passed, but uh, I'll keep it in mind. Um, yeah. No. So I call. So you know, I had a. I had a tech engineer who was a very good friend of mine and I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but uh, uh, he had a big problem with the VC and the management of the company and I represented him and we ended up winning yep. and uh, that got me a pretty good reputation with the other engineers. Yeah. Uh, and then I started calling myself the engineer's law firm and pretty soon I had a roster full of engineers. Interesting. You know, n none of them could pay me, of course, but they were great guys. And uh, it was pretty interesting because all these engineers, they would, you know, kind of want to see the technology I used to do legal stuff. And I told them, you know, what it was and how much it cost and how we did it. And they just looked at me and they're like, are you kidding me? That is terrible. And they said, you should do it this way. And you know, pretty soon I got more and more familiar with the engineering and then started to learn about artificial intelligence. And, and then I had an idea for how we could use a particular type of AI uh, to vastly improve the way we search unstructured data, which is what lawyers have to do all the time. And so I met uh, and really clicked with this data scientist named Mac McCartney, who's been a 30 year data scientist, 20 years machine learning. And we started talking about, you know, how we could build an AI ecosystem that would really improve search. And, uh, you know, beginning of 2018, we decided to go for it. Now you had another little, you, you were telling me about this other little project you had. The, the, ah, council. Yeah, so with the Q. Council with the Q. 2014, so that's sort of before you did this. So. That was when I was just kind of getting into it. Yeah. So, so you made this, this sort of what a discovery platform for lawyers, like a, like a search index of lawyers. Well, I'll give you kind of the evolution of it. So I left Proskauer in 2010 and had my own firm and I discovered the one thing that I missed. I didn't really miss much about the big firm, but the one thing I did miss was the ability to send an email to all the lawyers in the firm, you know, in, in the event there's some oddball type of question you don't know the answer to. And, you know, as a solo, you don't really have that network. So I decided to replicate that network. What I did was I called uh, the Harvard alumni office and I asked them, 
you know, can you give me a list of every Harvard graduate who has their own law firm? And the alumni office said, of course not. <laughs> we don't keep that record. Right. And so by hook and by crook, I managed to get a list of Harvard law grads with their own firms. And I just started emailing them and said, do you want to join this group? And so we had a mail, like an email list. Yeah. It was just like a big, you know, with like 70 names on it. And then uh, my friend and sometimes client, a fellow named TJ Dwayne, uh, who's out in the Bay Area. He was a classmate of mine, Harvard 02, uh, and then later went to Stanford Business School. Uh, great, great guy. But uh, he and I were talking about it, and then TJ kind of took the lead in putting it you know, onto a nice platform, and, and it's been a really useful thing for all the lawyers that are on it. We exchange and refer business, and it's really great. So did that go anywhere, or was that sort of not too profitable and useful, uh, but obviously not enough to like focus your full energy into. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. It's very useful, but it's one of these useful ideas that's hard to figure out how to monetize. Um, I, I would, I would suspect that uh, the way you would really do it is just put something like that as an add-on to some other uh, technology. Maybe as a sales funnel. Could be, could be. But you know, we proved that there was a. Uh, a need for it and a use for it and that added value but uh, you know I think TJ was busy with his stuff and I was busy with mine so we never really you know tried to make it profitable so you were telling me about this other guy who, um, who who's a deep data science expert what was his name Ma again? yeah that's Mac McCartney okay who's my uh, my co-founder at Agnes Intelligence so where was the moment where you actually sort of crystallized on the idea and said hey, we need a corporation, it's time to be in business. Can you sort of um, give a, a finer lens to that time? Yeah. And, and Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a deep story because uh, the, it didn't have anything to do so much with the tech as it did my own perception out there in the vineyards trying cases. Uh, and I just saw the legal system becoming buried in data, and I saw the quality of the courts plummeting, to be perfectly honest. Uh, un and, unpack that for me. Quality of the courts plummeting. Like, what, what are we, like, give me an example if you would. Um, well, I gotta be, I gotta be careful. Yeah. I, I, I can't, because uh, I don't want to say anything specific, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I will tell you, we, we should probably cut over here. Okay. Um, when you're a lawyer and you're in a case and the judge is not on the level, yeah. you know it. Yeah. And it's a it's a horrendous feeling. Um, so it, a feel like a there's a power dynamic there. Oh, sure is. It, it's a bur maybe a burning um, more than just an itch that you need to scratch. It's like a a burning sensation that that you feel maybe needs to be put out with a with a fire hose or something. Well, so then you know, I, it, it's going to take a little bit of unpacking, but yeah. you know, when you see this general phenomenon of institutions not working like they should be working, and that's you know, that's not just legal; that's a lot of our institutions. Um, then you start saying to yourself, "Well, what what happened? What changed?" And it's very easy in the case of uh, our justice system to to identify uh, our system. And a lot of people don't know this, but our system of justice is based upon rules and procedures from 1938. That means the way we go about solving disputes is optimized for the kind of disputes that we had 80 years ago. Okay, and how is, how, is that different from, do you think disputes have somehow structurally changed yes. in a way? Okay, so, so talk about that. Okay, well, uh, in 1938, if you and I had a disagreement and one of us sued the other, uh, we would go into a process called discovery. That's where we exchange ah. documents. Okay. Okay. Now, 1938, we didn't even have a copy machine. Yeah. Okay. We had, uh, if you wanted to make more than one copy, you needed carbon paper. Right. So you can imagine 
the volume of paper that got exchanged was very small. Okay. Okay. Now, fast forward. Copy machine. Okay, now that adds to the weight. Okay, now the mainframes. Yeah. Now, email. Right. Now, uh, so cloud software as a service. Um, the capacity of human beings to... You know, we're, you're, I'm giving you the 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 uh, scenic Very tour scenic. here. Here, let's give let's yeah. give them a let's give them a, a, give a twirl here. Yeah, give them a twirl. This is this Look is a beautiful industrial Brooklyn. The job of lawyers and courts has fundamentally changed. You know, a case involving that much paper is a very different project than 20 terabytes of unstructured electronic data. And let me let me be a sort of uh, interjector here. Of course, um, I'm not a lawyer, but I I have a I think I I would have made a great lawyer. Anyway, that's not the. You have a, a small guy like you, right, running a two-person-ish law firm. Yep. Versus a massive multinational global law firm with two thousand employees. They could bury you in paperwork, but that that's just a. A metaphor. They could bury you in terabytes, and, and you would be—it'd be impossible for you financially. And you know that's the sort of strategy they they may play. Um, so is is this is this touching on some yes. of the, the the things that you've seen? All right, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. Um, what does it mean if you can't afford to go to court? What does that mean? That means you have no rights. Okay, it means you have perhaps temporary provisional accommodations until somebody decides you don't. But if you can't go to court to enforce your rights, you don't have any rights. And we're in a world right now, given the volume of data that's involved in litigation, given the cost of reviewing that data, 99.9% .9 of people can't afford to go to court and litigate a significant case. So what does that mean? That means the law, instead of being a tool of equality, is actually a tool of oppression uh, by those large institutions that can afford lawyers and everybody else. So, go, go ahead. So how does, this is sort of the, the, the state of, of things now. So moving from the copy era you know, to the modern era and then where in that reality did you and your and your partner decide to, you know, address um, a problem? And what problem is it that you're addressing? You're saying document discovery, right. but to, it's a great question. Um, identifying the problem is is the first step to solving it. And there, if you go to uh, legal conferences, you'll see a lot of. Uh, confusion about what the problem even is. Yeah. Okay, the problem is very simple. How do we go through a large pile of unstructured data and minimize the amount of human time and effort spent looking at irrelevant documents? Uh huh. So if you start to think about it that way, how do I structure my work so that I see the relevant stuff but don't waste time on irrelevant stuff? Interesting. And that's the core challenge. Um, and whoever solves that is going to solve a $50 billion a year problem. So how do you and your partner, uh, you know, even begin to tackle this? Like what was step one? Okay. So step one, step one was I learned about a particular branch of statistics and applied math called hierarchical agglomerative clustering. It's also called agglomerative nesting or ag NAS. Uh-huh. Uh, and yes, my uh, nine-month-old baby daughter bears the name of a AI algorithm. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so, shoot, what, what was the question? Um, what was step one for you? Ah, step one. All right. So what this branch of math enables is you to take, you know, a million documents and convert those documents into numbers and then cluster those documents by logical concept. And when I learned that that was feasible, 
I then said, well, shit, what if we took this million emails, let's say, and we find a way to cluster them and organize them into groups without any human supervision. And, uh, and then we could select from those basically labeled buckets and pull those up to the top so that you're continually reviewing documents that the technology has deemed likely to be relevant. Okay, and so, so you have a thesis, and how long did it take you to get your first prototype? Uh, we started in January. We spent a couple weeks in a conference room at DEF Method, D-E-F Method. Uh, it's owned by Joe Leo, and they're great engineering and uh, prototype guys. Okay, so you outsourced. You outsourced. Well, it wasn't outsourced. We, we actually, Mac and I went in and sat with uh, Joe Leo and Julia McAllister and really just went through uh, an agonizing ordeal of uh, really figuring out what it was we were building. Yeah, but did you did you offer them equity? <coughs> did did was it a uh, client customer relationship with this firm? They they they're, they're, uh, they got paid some money and and also they took some equity and they've been very uh, very accommodating to us. Right. So so that incentivizes them to uh, to to, we'll to cross and then to uh, both influence you uh, in, in a possibly uh, unintended direction, but also, in theory, um, incentivizes them to uh, not try and bleed you dry as a client customer. Oh, no, yeah, that's not what they're about. You know, they're, they're really about long-term relationships and, uh, you know, getting ideas on their feet. You know, not to say they don't have to pay the rent too, but, uh, you know, death method, in my opinion, uh, does it right? Okay, so they're they're a, they're a tech firm. They're yeah. So you 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 spend a lot of time with your business partner, <coughs> and you, you you just so so you're hashing out a prototype. And what was the first actual tangible like thing that you had on the screen? You know, how long did that take to get, and what was it? It was uh, we put up a set of documents. That had once that I had done uh, in a real case, yeah, right. But of course, I didn't have this technology, yeah. And so I said, Mac, why don't we take this? I think it was like twenty thousand emails or something. I said, why don't we put these uh, up onto this platform and at least see how they cluster? Yeah. And so he put them up and got them to cluster, and you know, made a little workflow. And I said, Holy smokes, this is going to work. Yeah. And he's like, I told you. <laughs> so right there, and how long, how, how many weeks of, of tech prototyping did it actually take to get to that? Oh, I think that was probably middle of March. So it was two or three months. Yeah. So, um, and I just want to, I just want to step it back for all the, the other. Now, you had a team of engineers working. It wasn't just like a solo guy. It was uh, mostly Mac McCartney. Yeah. And at the beginning, it was, uh, I think, a couple other engineers building the initial <laughs> prototype. Um, but for much of the year, it was Mac and one sysadmin. Yeah. And uh, the reason is because Mac, you know, he's a 30 year data scientist. He's been working on machine learning for 20 years. Interesting. Nobody's what, been working on machine learning for 20 now, years. Now, was he, was he at Google? Uh, like, no, he was, he was at... Uh, <laughs> big, a big firm? Yeah, it was a big firm that got, he was at Lotus. Yeah, Lotus uh, Notes, Lotus which, 1, 2, 3. And then that, I think, got bought by IBM. Uh, and then he was, oh, he was at Cengage as well. Yeah. Which is a big educational um, you know, publication firm. So your, your Mac, your partner, is a guy who's um, obviously intelligent and has just had the luxury of, you know, refining a very, relevant and, 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 and quite frankly, powerful skill set. Um, so you, you were just telling, you know, just saying how good, how good he was. And, you know, for, for the purpose of uh, just for me trying to understand how long it took you to prototype. Um, well, I'd say, you know, prototype, the initial prototype was probably, I guess, two or three months. But then to get to a beta version yeah. uh, that, you know, may not have a beautiful front end, but at least everything's 
you know, the numbers are moving where they should. Yeah. Um, that I think we got done probably around November. Uh, a couple other pieces came in in December. Now, um, are you, and just to give you an idea, you know, he's been on this journey for, for a year. Um, and the way, the best metaphor I like to give is you pull back before you punch. And so he's been pulling back. And in that process of pulling back, did you start, when you said the word beta, that means to me testers. Yeah. So did you start, uh, did, were you holding your cards close to the chest or did you start, um, you know, showing this beta to other potential customers? Um, you know, tell me about that. Well, so uh, the first beta tester was my law firm. Yeah. Because uh, I do ha still have a couple cases that I'm doing and I had some documents I had to look at. So I said, Mac, can you throw these up on the system and spin me up an instance? And he's like, sure. So, uh, so I put that up and I showed my client and he couldn't believe it. Uh, and so, you know, so I had to test it myself first. Um, so, so tell me, yeah. and, 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 you know, be bearing in mind, I'm not trying to go for any breach of confidentiality here, but in a most abstract sense, you, you, you put the documents from the case into the system. Yep. What did that A, save you from uh, a lot of work and B, did it produce any unintended beneficial consequences? So uh, one of the cool things about the technology is that it, uh, uh, it, it operates purely based on statistical significance, which means you can search you take a, a word or phrase, put it into the search box, it'll go find every instance of that word or phrase or similar words and phrases in the corpus. What it then does, takes all the hits, and instead of just giving you page after page of results like Google, what it does is it clusters the results into uh, conceptual buckets, let's say, with labels on them. And that enables you to navigate through a giant pile of unstructured data uh, not just by keyword, but by concept. So um, give me an example of, and it doesn't have to be from that case, but I'm sure that there's a, a general case that you could talk about and general concepts of, of, of how your system, like, I want to know, like, what kind of concepts are we talking about? Like, do you have an example? Sure. Um, so uh, we did as a, uh, uh, as a demo, we took a thousand hours of the Joe Rogan podcast. Okay. You know, which are like, you know, some of those are like four hours long. Right. It's uh, it's a very interesting. So this is interesting in that we're not talking law anymore. We're talking just a general podcast. Well, so, so you know, uh, our, you know, Agnes Intelligence, it's an AI company. It's a data science company. Um, we've developed a new and improved way of searching unstructured data that has use cases, obviously in law, but also media. Also, private investigations. You know, we're talking to some people about potentially using it for uh, political campaigns and op research. So there's a lot of uses for it. So, Joe Rogan. You know, you 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 put a thousand hours, of Joe. Ah, this is great. So what I do, you know, Joe Rogan uh, kind of likes a good conspiracy theory. So yeah. so I type in, and I'll show this to you. Uh, you could maybe even put it in. You type in conspiracy, and it goes out and looks for every time somebody on the Joe Rogan show talked about a conspiracy. Yeah. What it then does is it looks around that word, says, okay, so what are they talking about? What context are they talking about when they talk about conspiracy? And so you'll see moon landing, you'll see Lee Harvey Oswald, you'll see mainstream media, you'll see CIA. And so it actually takes all the conspiracies that he's talked about in all those hundreds and hundreds of shows and it uh, breaks them into category entirely with math, no, uh -huh. hu no human intervention. How useful do you think it is? Well, I'll give you a, a perspective. Um, one of the things that we've pursued with this technology is mar kind of marrying it up with uh, some of the great voice to text and natural language algorithms that are out there. And so what we can do is we can upload uh, audio or video data. It automatically transcribes so that there's a, a transcript. And uh, when you 
search those, you can then uh, pick what you're looking for and it'll go right to the spot within the recording. So you don't ever again have to screw around, you know, oh, there was this podcast four days ago where he said something cool. I think it was kind of in the middle of it, <laughs> you know? And so, so, you know, and, and I hear uh, various people talking about the rise of the spoken word in our culture as supplanting the written word. The spoken word is now more powerful than, than the written word. It's more... Uh, well, see, we, we are producing spoken word. We are right now. And, and five years ago, you would have been writing essays. <laughs> but now it's so cheap and easy to do this. Yeah. Why would you do the other? Exactly. Here's the problem. You can't search it. <laughs> How do you search this? Um, well, I'll, give, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, you YouTube does auto, uh, you know, digest the, the audio. Yeah. And inside of YouTube, when you do a search, they actually make use of that. Well, they, 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 they do, but they, what they don't do is they don't enable you to search the contents by concept, yeah. nor do they enable you to go right to the spot. Tell me <laughs> what your business model is. So we have built uh, and designed and patented a new and we believe far better uh, method of searching spoken word data by concept. So at least a pat you have at least a patent play. Um, but I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, no. So, so and this has been evolving, right? You know, you start out, you have a great idea for a new way to search. You build it. It works. And then you say, okay, now I got to figure out how to get this into people's hands and, you know, productize it. Yeah. Uh, and so what we've kind of uh, figured out is, you know, it's a little bit easier for an investor to get their arms around one use case and say, okay, I'm going to use this. I'm going to spend 200 grand building out such and such. And here's 20 different accounts we could get that would pay a million dollars each. Yeah. You know, rather than you know, here's something that's gonna change the world and revolutionize a hundred different industries and try to price that. Okay, so productize. Uh, I think it's a new word, but I think it's a great word. Um, how are you productizing Agnes Intel? Well, we're uh, building a, a platform that can exist on any cloud environment. It's gonna be compatible with Google, IBM, Microsoft, uh, AWS. You know, we're starting out with a platform that focuses on uh, the analysis and search of audio video data, because that's probably the biggest, you know, uh, distinguisher. Yep. Uh, but also, as we're doing that, we're also building out a legal platform yeah. uh, that has a front to back comprehensive workflow that will enable a lawyer to review a massive amount of data in a much, much shorter period of time. Very interesting. Um, I want to go back to one word you said, which is investor. So you and your partner are the partners in this venture. Are you interested in investment? Are you, are you just chilling on that for the moment, you know? We're, the, you know, Ideally, what I'm looking for is smart money. Yep. Um, we, we, we just literally spoke about dumb money on the last episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, dumb money can be expensive. So, you know, we want, we want people who, I mean, I got a guy I'm talking to right now and, you know, he looked at the technology and he says, holy shit, I could use this to blah, 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 yep. right? And uh, I said, well, do you know how to, if I built it, could you sell it? And he says, hell yes, I could sell it. I said, all right, let's figure it out. And so, you know, we're putting together some numbers and he's going to get a couple investors and we're going to build out that little project and tell him to go crazy and, you know, we'll split the profits. Um, so you, you really view it in a real la laissez-faire kind of way. What about, um, you know, big vision for your company? Uh, w you know, would you be... Uh, okay with an investor, you know, uh, steering uh, the ship? Uh, they better be very smart and very uh, in tune with what we're about. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
Uh, you know, listen, I understand as a, uh, uh, as, as a person who's gone through it, that uh, all of this is very, very new. And the economics of AI, I think, are not very well understood. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you think about it, what we're doing would have been impossible two years ago. Yeah. Because there just wasn't the cloud AI resources that exist now. Okay, I, I, I want to speculate. Um, so Google uh, has, uh, Apple has Siri. Uh, mm -hmm. Google has its own brand, which I'm not familiar with because they haven't done a good job at branding. Microsoft has its own uh, virtual assistant. Um, is there any kind of play you think um, for a new kind of virtual assistant that this technology could enable? Yeah, there, maybe well, in an API service model, or 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 more close, working more closely with a with a maybe a Facebook who doesn't really have a virtual assistant at the moment. Uh, you know, it would definitely be something that we could uh, talk about. One of the features that we're building is the ability in a legal case, like when you're actually at trial yeah. and a witness is testifying. We're creating a tool that will take the words that are spoken, transform them into a search that gets run, you know, once every five seconds or so, and it will bring up to your screen the documents from the case that relate most closely to the testimony that was just given. So you're talking about a real-time courtroom, like, analysis tool? <coughs> exactly. So, like, you, you have on your screen, you'll have on the left side the testimony as it's being transcribed into the system. Yeah. And that those words will then be analyzed by the technology to pull out the statistically significant terms, use those to search the documents in the case corpus, and it'll return in real time as the witness speaks documents that the system thinks relate to the testimony just given. Does that uh, make sense? It does. Objection. Okay. Um, what, are, what are your grounds, Counselor? So we are actually filing a motion. Uh, 501c4 has officially uh, declared uh, in the state of Alaska that um, using a computer-assisted, uh, you know, um, d systems are, are now prohibited in the court. Oh, you're, you're giving me a... Uh Hypothetical. Hypothetical that, that they just decide to ban my technology. Exactly. It's sort of like, uh, you know, I was, watch I was watching this, this uh, oh my goodness. I was watching this video about Wilt Chamberlain and how they changed all the rules so that he couldn't dominate. Exactly. Um, you know, the block, uh, the, the goaltending. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose different courts could have different rules on that, but uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, the courts are in the business of dispensing speedy, inexpensive justice. That's what they're supposed to be doing. And by the way, I have a very good relationship with the courts. Um, one of our partners, a fellow named Tom Vanaski, uh, and Judge Vanaski was a uh, federal judge for 25 years just retired and he's joined Agnes Intelligence Very. because because what we're doing is a game changer. Yeah. And what we're doing is really the first uh, fully actualized plan that anybody's ever come forward with to reduce significantly the cost of justice. You mentioned you have a media platform you're trying to roll out. Talk about that. Well, so, you know, one of the phenomenon that I've seen, and this is, you know, this affects you, is uh, just the explosion of podcasting, citizen journalism, independent media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more and more uh, people are not watching mainstream media. Yeah. Uh, the problem is we don't have adequate distribution channels. Uh, and there's the concern about free speech, there's the concern about cen censorship, and, but also there's the concern about it's just not a good tool 
to search it. And so what we are able to do, we're able to upload audio and video data, transcribe it, and search it by concept, which will make listeners able to go and find everybody who's talking about what they're interested in talking about, whether they have you know, a million listeners or 10 listeners. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very interesting space. Um, and I know some people who are, who, who are working on that. Um, That's a place I'm looking for. Uh, I, I'm actually looking for a media partner who really wants to build you know, the greatest media technology in the world, make a totally searchable, uh, totally self-sustaining platform. Uh, I am looking for a partner who well, wants to a, work on that. There's a lot of, of smaller podcast companies that haven't been consolidated. Um, so I think there's one avenue and, you know, even the larger ones, Spotify, the one that this one runs off of, it's called Anchor. Um, right. Spotify <coughs> just Excuse consolidated me. Anchor. Uh, and by consolidated, I mean bought. Yep, uh, they're uh, buying everything. Well, they bought another podcast company too, but there's a lot of other podcast companies that I'm aware of. Um, and, and maybe, you know, some kind of play there uh, would sweeten their offering. Well, I, I think it would be, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think it'd be a great thing. And, uh, you know, I definitely hope we can find the right partner and get that uh, up and running in the next uh, 12 months. Just because, you know, it's not even so much the business as, you know, it's cool. <laughs> and I, you know, I did this, I didn't do this necessarily to make a lot of money. I hope I do, but it'd be nice. But, you know, really the reason I did it is because I had a whole bunch of engineer friends and we had some great ideas and, you know, we all like to build cool shit. So that's what we're here for. Well, there's an old quote from Steve Jobs that I would like to bring up. And his quote is, do not start with the technology and then figure out how to sell it. And I'm paraphrasing here. Right. Start with the customer experience. He has more scar tissue than, he, than anybody, you know, on, on this exact issue. So what do, you say, what do you say to that? Start with the customer experience and then figure out how to enable that experience. Well, I would never, presume to dispute Steve Jobs, but I will tell you that uh, in my own journey, uh, it sort of started the opposite way. I became familiar with this particular technology and noted that pretty much nobody was using it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I found out the reason was because it's very hard to work with. Um, and so I immediately saw a hundred use cases for it. Uh, and the difficulty uh, that I encountered was trying to figure out uh, the best thing to go for first. Yeah, so I, prioritization, I think, is, is super critical. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't have infinite wealth and infinite time. Right, you can't make, you, you don't have enough money to make a lot of mistakes. Um, you can make one or two, but not too many. But you, you said, you, you brought this up earlier, which is um, at the high wire, you cannot fail. Correct. So tie, let's, tie that, let's tie that back together. Um, you know, yes, you're building amazingly cool stuff, but there's something in you where you, you're aware that failure is, is, is not that fun of an option. That's correct. Um, and I guess tying them together um, you know, high wire is what you do when you're fearless and young. And uh, AI is what you do when you're fearless and a little bit older. Yeah. <laughs> with, with a lot more experience, um, a, a, a solid grounding in legal, but also um, I think it's intelligent. I think it's, it's a good strategy to not narrow yourself um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave that point right there. Cause I know, I know, I know lots would dispute that. Uh, some say, um, you know, be a product or be an API and be really specific about what industry you're in. But, uh, I think there's, I think there's merits to, um, exploring, especially in, in, in the early, uh, ish 
phase as you are now. Well, so, so I'm gonna give you uh, kind of the Rosetta Stone for the way I look at it. And, uh, you know, people can feel free to agree or disagree. Um, looking around the world, I am tremendously concerned about the uh, prospect of what I'll call uh, cyber totalitarianism. Uh, you see what's going on in uh, China with the social credit scores. You see what's going on here with uh, censorship based on viewpoint. And uh, these are not healthy things. What I, you know, and, and, and add to that the fact that we have a justice system that doesn't work for 99% of the people. Yeah, and there's a huge economic uh, issue there that, that, that that's uh, ripe. As you said, 50, it's a $50 billion industry. So I asked myself the following question, uh, and this really came into focus uh, in May when I had my first child. Mm. And I held that beautiful little baby Agnes in my arms and, and looked at her and I, I said to myself, you know, if she lives a ordinary long life, she's gonna end up seeing 2100. Yeah. And I said, I want this world to be a place in 2100 where she's free. Mm. And not just her, but everybody. And I said, well, what, how do you stop digital totalitarianism? Uh, how do you stop AI from controlling us? And, you know, I hear Elon Musk talking about it kind of hopelessly. I, yeah, he, he, I, I, I have lots of opinions, but I want to hear yours. Well, so, so here's the best answer I can come up with, and maybe it's good and maybe it's not. I, I work backwards. I say, what technologies or tools, if they existed and were available to everybody, would make it impossible to have digital totalitarianism. And so you, you follow, like what, what conditions make totalitarianism impossible? And I came to the following answer. I said, number one, we have to have a technology that will enable justice to be dispensed on a somewhat equal basis. Doesn't have to be perfect, but at least somewhat equal. Number two, there has to be a media platform that can't be taken down by any non-state actor that allows for free speech. And number three, there has to be a tool for honest and accurate measurement of public opinion. And so I've designed systems that when fully implemented will bring about those results and I believe will make cyber totalitarianism impossible. Well, uh, thrust. My political thrust, God, I try to stay out of it. But I mean, you, you, you were saying, you know, you were saying that, that, that you have some potential applications for this technology in, in, in the political sphere. Ah. Are, are you, are you um, productizing or, or coming to market um, at the moment with anything on that? Yeah, we're, we're looking at in the next two to three months, uh, getting some beta users up uh, just for the kind of the narrow aspect of our product that focuses on audio video search um, you know and then getting a couple good solid reference cases there and then building out from that point let's talk let's talk a little blue sky as we wrap this up there is a beautiful blue sky look at that look at that talk to me john about luck and business luck uh luck seems to happen when you work your ass off that's, that's my view on it. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I've learned artificial intelligence the same way I learned to ride a unicycle on a high wire, which is spend a great deal of time on it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I have any particular, you know, great talent. I think I just have the willingness to beat my head against the brick wall until I break through. It's, it's not just you, it's, your, it's you, your partner, you have, you have some new uh, associates or um, people that are teaming up with you. So at the biggest sense, I see uh, a field ripe for innovation. I see you, you're executing uh, at the technical level, but more importantly, at the, the vision level, you're, you're selling, um, which some say is the most important thing for a CEO. And you're open to partnerships. So... Uh, I'm optimistic 
on Agnes Intel. Excellent. Well, that's good to hear, man. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing here where I give each, should I be the Siskel and Ebert of entrepreneurs? Yeah. Like one thumb up, thumb down. You know, you know, you know what would suck is if you told me I should just quit. <laughs> Sorry, that's never gonna work. Um, I, the, you know, that, that's, that, it, that, that is not, I, I may have done that to, to, to other people, but I am not telling you to just quit. I will tell you, I had a kid call me up who was, who was just starting a company and it was a legal product and the idea was horrible. Yeah. And I had to, I, you know, I had a little bit of soul searching because he asked me, I was, I was like, what should I say? And I said to him as gently as I possibly could, uh, this is not going to work. And God, it was terrible. So he, so, but, but hopefully I saved him some time. Yeah, exactly. So once you get, you get past the ego, right? <laughs> um, you're say you're, you, you, any kind of feedback is, is to your advantage. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, the, the thing I say to people who are going to start these things is, uh, you know, you're going to spend a year with everybody telling your idea is terrible and uh, it's never going to work. And, you know, you got to sort of have a personality that, uh, uh, you know, let you say go to hell and, <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it anyway. Hopefully you will be proven right. Here we go. We can run across here. We're going to uh, the best bagel store in Brooklyn, Shelsky's, which is owned by Peter Shelsky. Uh, he was a great longtime friend of mine. So this is kind of the quintessential Brooklyn experience. I love it. On that note, um, thank you so much, John, for joining me. And I cannot wait to see um, what Agnes Intel has in store for the future. So you're going to San Francisco this week yes, to speak at the IBM Artificial Intelligence Conference. Are there any other milestones um, that we should be looking for, that the public should be looking for? I think uh, in the next 60 to 90 days, we should have some big announcements uh, regarding uh, new products coming out and new partnerships. So, uh, but I don't want to jinx anything quite yet. So Agnes, A-G-N-E-S? Yes, sir. Or A-G-G-N-E-S? A-G-N-E-S. Intel. Agnes Intelligence. Yes, sir. Uh, is, is that a dot com? Dot com. Agnesintel.com. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you so much.